Hello, lighting people. The Illuminating Engineering Society impacts our industry in so many positive ways. Through standards, research, education, outreach, and events, the organization continuously pushes forward the art and science of illumination to help benefit the public. Since so much is going on in the industry right now, we thought this would be a good time to catch up with the person who heads up industry relations for the IES, Mark Lean. We'll discuss the present state of the industry as well as look at some forward looking predictions for what we may have in store in the lighting industry in the years to come. Mark, hello and thank you for joining us today for five big questions. Thanks, Al. Good to see you uh, with both of us working at different positions again. <laughs> it is, Mark. Yes, our, uh, our careers have intersected many different ways, and I'm glad to catch up with you here today to discuss the lighting industry. And one great article that I recently read in the official publication of the IES, LDNA, ah. was a, an article by you that discussed many different ways in which the lighting industry may be transformed in the future. And one of those aspects you cited was new competition. Tell us more about the new competition aspect of what you see in the future. Sure. Um, we've seen a decrease, Al, in new companies uh, starting into the lighting industry that uh, were peripheral or even seemingly irrelevant uh, previously. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example of that. It, uh, <laughs> You know, we don't normally look to Edgar Allan Poe for lighting advice, but he said something I think that was really prescient and, and it applies. He said, experience has shown and a true philosophy will always show that a vast, perhaps larger portion of the truth arises from what is seemingly irrelevant. And I think the truth about our future is that these companies and, and technologies that were seemingly irrelevant are now becoming um, dominant. Uh, and we're, what the companies that we're seeing come into our industry, they're not um, pure lighting companies for the most part. They're companies that have already been here. So think uh, Samsung, Apple, Google, Amazon, Verizon, Train, Honeywell. You've got the internets, the uh, electronics, the telecoms, um, and even the HVAC companies, although not quite as progressive as the others, they're all trying to create devices um, no, trying to unite devices in ways that make it um, easier for consumers and, and they've added lighting to their portfolio. So that's where we're seeing a lot of the innovation right now. And it's coming from these people that aren't from our existing lighting community. They were peripheral or seemingly irrelevant. Um, and certainly companies like Amazon and Apple, other than selling product, we don't think of them as developing it, but they have with connected home over IP, Apple, Amazon, and Google all united to do that. So I, I think what we're seeing now is not new companies coming in to be pure lighting companies. Our existing lighting companies have um, slowed in terms of innovation, if not stopped altogether. And the new players are the ones that can put all these devices together. And some of them are playing well in the lighting community. They just have to learn about it. Yeah, for sure. There's there's lots of different players and it's exciting to see these these convergences of technologies from outside players who are now becoming part of our industry, at least in part. And when we look at one of those things you mentioned as far as the existing companies, um, and that actually ties to that same article where you said some of them may be struggling for relevance in the future. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Well, there was there was no exit strategy from the solid state lighting revolution. So the the problem that the industry faced is that we really didn't have a plan to transition when solid state lighting ended. And when I say when it ended, it's, I mean, when it became um, not profitable uh, and we've seen the demonetization occur already. So the profits have been taken out of it. And one of the first things that go as a consequence of that is research. Um, if you don't have a lot of profits, you're not going to be investing a lot in research. And unfortunately, they didn't have um, the mindset to put a lot of new products into the pipeline while the profits were rolling in. They were uh, spent in other ways. Now, Steve Jobs um, identified the problem with HP, uh, and he said it applied to other companies as well, in that um, companies start out with a unique uh, product. Or, or offering or service of some type. And then they reward the researchers and engineers and developers of those products 
But over time, the rewards and the incentives shift toward the people who sell the most and they take their eye off the pipeline. Adding to that, if you wanna increase shareholder value, one of the best ways for the past decade or so has been incremental advancements to your products. And then you could get a, a return on investment within a quarter or two, and that was necessary in order to keep the shareholders happy. So there wasn't a lot of money going into the R&D and there were disconnects between the R&D group and the product groups. And as a result, we find ourselves in a position where there's not a lot of innovation and new products coming from the large existing companies as a rule. Yeah, that's uh, interesting feedback. And when, when we look at one of those product categories that have been around for quite some time, it's seeing quite a resurgence these days in the pandemic times is UV disinfection lighting. Yeah. And when yeah. we look at um, the IES and its recent partnership with the International Ultraviolet Association to explore standards, it's, it's a really good step forward to help this uh, technology be implemented responsibly. But, but how, Mark, how will that cooperation between you and, and the other association, how will that allow the, the, the public to truly make sure that these standards are widely adopted, followed, and enforced? Okay, let me let me separate enforced <laughs> from the rest <laughs> of it for a minute, uh, but I'll get back to it. Um, we've been very successful at the IES at having our standards adopted. Um, part of the reason for that is that we don't have competitors, and I don't mean that to be arrogant. I'm I'm. I think being realistic to say it, there are groups like the CIE, they do great work and, and we, you know, we respect what they're doing and they're great for the lighting industry and the lighting community, but we don't overlap or conflict very much with them. They do more in the metrology area um, and we, we work on applications in design as well as metrology. Um, they don't do anything with design and applications. That's, that's just not their turf. So, we are the group that writes the American National Standards for Lighting, and American National Standards are important uh, in terms of regulations and, and legislation, so we find ourselves being adopted um, well. Um, part of what we've been doing lately is forming alliances with a lot of um, groups that previously we weren't involved with. Um, we've strengthened our alliances with the International Dark Sky Association. We've strengthened our alliances with um, uh, with well building. We've done MOUs with them. We've done them with the National Park Service. And we already had established relationships. We sit on committees and write documents and standards with ASHRAE and, um, and uh, oh, Golly, USGBC, AIA, ICC, I mean, it just goes on and on. DOE, of course. So it, there's multiple government standards that are in place that refer to our recommendations and standards um, and then multiple CFRs. And uh, I, I don't see that changing. Um, we're, as a nonprofit, we can't lobby. But what we can do is um, is advocate uh, for our industry and our members and and the public in in terms of how lighting benefits them, and we've done hill visits um, to Congress and and we've been I think successful uh, with that. So we create awareness, but that's in terms of adoption. I, I think that'll continue with IUVA. Uh, it's it's a there's so much interest in germicidal ultraviolet right now, and there's a lot of horrible products uh, in the marketplace that take people's money and give them a false sense of security, but doesn't do much else. So IUVA, I think this is very strong, and, and we're also working with ASHRAE on germicidal ultraviolet. Um, and the more united we can be in creating a document, the more organizations are behind it, the more it, it's likely to be adopted. But none of us are focused on enforcement. That's a whole different game. Understood. And one of the things you just mentioned relates to the IES being a nonprofit organization, um, yet it still relies on revenues, obviously, to fund all of the great things that your organization does. In the last fiscal year that ended, 2019, the organization generated approximately $8.6 million in revenue, with 3.3 .3 of that coming from Light Fair 2019 yeah. in Philadelphia. In 2020, of course, 
light fair, uh, the live version of light fair did not happen. The exhibition was canceled. The conference was converted to a virtual conference. So those $3.3 million of revenue will not be there in 2020. So given that and given still some possible future uncertainty looking forward to 2021, how is the IES surviving these days? You hurt me, Al. Uh, those are painful <laughs> reminders. Um, but uh, losing light fare in 2020, there's no doubt that that was tough. Um, and as a 501c3 nonprofit organization, we're always cognizant of expenses, but definitely even more so now. Uh, we've been very fortunate in that the leadership of the organization uh, has um, been successful in uh, keeping the staff. We haven't had layoffs. Uh, and that speaks to the quality of the work that the staff's doing and how they've adjusted to working remotely. None of us have been in the office now, you know, since the, you know, pandemic hit. Um, so I'd say the transition's been remarkable. And it's, it's a great staff. I don't want to see any of them lose their jobs, because what we're doing, I, I believe is, is very valuable. Um, Light fair, that was a that was a huge hit. Um, street and area, um, you know, other conferences uh, going virtual. You, you, we're not making a lot of money on the virtual stuff, no doubt about it. Um, somebody told me it was a business book. I read this in a business book. They said, if you if you um, cease to exist, if your company cease to exist tomorrow, what difference would it make? Which is just causing you to ask yourself, what do we do that's unique and valuable um, and that nobody else does? With a lot of companies, particularly the ones focused on incremental growth, their competitors would just fill the gaps. They just start filling the orders because everything's so darn similar anyway. But with the IES, I can't even imagine what it would be like without the IES because there's nobody doing this. Um, and it'd take, uh, imagine how long it would take for somebody to step up and start putting, you know, 70 some committees in place and getting the American national standard recognition and all of that, the partnerships that we've built. Fortunately, we have sustaining members and we have event sponsors and our, and our membership is up. Um, so I, uh, there are people that, that see the value um, and I'm, I'm very thankful for it. Um, and so far, we're doing okay. No, oh, that's, that's excellent to hear. Yeah, we, um, we, we acknowledge that. And I didn't mean to rub salt in the wound, but just obviously <laughs> it's one of the major forms of income for, for, yeah. for your organization and it others. So, so it's good to see that there's responsible management and that the staff, the very talented and specialized staff is, is intact and moving forward, uh, albeit a little differently than we used to. So when, when we look at your role as industry relations, I know you're not in charge of government affairs right now, but uh, certainly you have that type of experience in mm -hmm. your uh, impressive career. But so if you had to just look at the, um, the, 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 the big picture, and if there was one piece of legislation that you think could help the industry or help those impacted by our industry that you would love to see uh, some sort of legislation that's written and passed through Congress and turned into law, what, what, what would you like to see? Um, I'd, I'd like to see 90.1 as a minimum federal building code. It astounds me that as many people that purport to be concerned about energy savings in the United States have not advocated for a minimum energy building code. And 90.1, that's what it's designed to do. It's, I mean, I, I, I sit on 91 committees. These people are, are smart, they're focused. They, I think it's a, it's a great tool, um, but it's not a tool that's widely used and it addresses existing buildings. So I think Al, if, if this were, I know if this were put into place, we'd be harvesting tremendous energy savings that it was intended to do. Um, so far and away, that's, that's my number one. Right there, and I'm. I, we do, uh, we do hill visits, right? So I talked to a congressman about this last year, in his office, and he's taking notes. He goes, "We don't have one. We don't have a minimum building code, right?" I I don't think there's a lot of awareness, and I don't think there's a lot of political will to pass regulations that are restrictive in any way, particularly in in the 
you know, administration that we've experienced uh, of late. So um, regulations, um, they have a lot of value. Um, and in this case, I think it would yield a tremendous savings for individuals and companies and, and certainly for the country in terms of power plants and generation and such things, carbon production and all that, or, or emissions. So I think that's important. That's, and I, there's a, a distant second request too, and that would be um, some type of regulations on um, LED products in the marketplace, because I've seen LED lamps at 2000 hour life. I mean, there's no excuse for that. That's just cheapening it to a ridiculous level. And there were um, requirements put into place um, under the uh, Obama administration that were rescinded the day after the inauguration of, of, our, of President Trump. And, and those had some value. Even NEMA supported them because, you know, here's manufacturers saying, you know, we got to have baselines here or people are going to flood the market and we don't have an even playing field. And so we're going through all the testing. We're trying to build quality products. You got to keep the junk out. But we don't have any of those regulations in place for LEDs right now. It's all voluntary. So there's two. Excellent. I, uh, as always, Mark, you bring some thought provoking and insightful ideas to the table based on experience and science and, and all the other things that uh, the IES and you personally have been involved with over the years. So really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to, to share these ideas with us and the audience today. So thank you for joining us for five big questions. I'm glad to do it, Al, and uh, anytime you call, okay? See you Sounds later. Good. Thanks, take care. Bye.